The Unshackled Waves, episode 193. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One of the politicians in Australia who has really rattled the political establishment lately is Senator Fraser Anning from Catter's Australian Party after his blistering maiden speech defending traditional Australia and calling for a plebiscite on further immigration. And we're lucky to be here uh, with uh, Senator Anning in his Brisbane office today. Uh, Senator Anning, welcome. Yeah, thanks Tim, nice to uh, be here with you. Now, you've seen a lot uh, in life. Your maiden speech that talked about uh, traditional Australia. Uh, can you describe what traditional Australia is to you and how you've seen it change over your lifetime? Yeah, well, uh, right now, uh, traditional Australia was you know, good Christian conservative values. Um, you know, 50 years ago, or not even that, 40 years ago, there were 99% uh, predominantly European Christians in the country, and now we're down to 75%. Uh, we're trending in the wrong direction. Uh, I think that most Australians uh, would want to try and keep our society the way it is and not change to uh, a society that uh, doesn't respect our culture. Now, you were part of uh, Pauline Hanson's One Nation's first incarnation, uh, which uh, when uh, she gave her own maiden speech to Parliament, you uh, joined uh, the party. What motivated you to actually get involved in politics? Because it was a... Uh, even 20 years ago, the, the, the cultural climate was at a tipping point. Uh, you're right, and uh, I think like a lot of Australians, conservative Australians, we, are, um, we didn't have any leadership and uh, we were worried that uh, we we're losing control of our country and, and its identity. So um, uh, when Pauline came along, she was saying things that we, uh, a lot of Australians believed in. Um, I think that the two-party system had gone way too far to the left and it's now gone way further for, to the left. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a cigarette paper between Labor and Liberal now. So where's the home for a Conservative? Where's, where's even the centre or right of centre? There's no one there. So Pauline became popular because she was voicing the, the ideas of the people on the right. Um, she, I think, now has lost away a little bit. She sort of flips and flops. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of hope, hopefully speaking for some of those people who are, uh, have been disenfranchised. Now you are still with the, the party uh, when it's, everyone calls it its second uh, incarnation in, in 2016. The, the party, or Pauline wasn't part of the party for, for many years, but what was your uh, initial thoughts when the party won four Senate seats at the 2016 federal election? <clears throat> well, I, was thought I, was, uh, I thought I was going to be a one nation senator. Um, and that was that was great. Uh, well, I wasn't there. Um, Roberts got in, uh, but then he was had his dual nationality, so he was dumped. And then I came in, fully expecting to be a One Nation senator, until that day, uh, the Monday when I went into Parliament. And, uh, I was attacked by Pauline. Uh, she said I stabbed her in the back. The fact is that she dumped me, not the other way around. So even that you've been in the party uh, 20 years, you felt that, uh, because obviously in politics there's uh, harsh words said between even, even colleagues, you you still felt that even with, with all that history you couldn't work with her anymore? Uh, <coughs> there was no way. Uh, she, um, she demanded that I fire four good uh, uh, Australian people, you know, who were working with Roberts uh, for the crime of talking to me on the telephone. So. That was never going to happen. I can't see that you need to fire people because you know she she saw that as a disloyalty. I was number two on the ticket, or sorry, number three on the ticket. I was the next person in line for the Senate seat, and telling me that I should fire them because they talked to me on the telephone before that that uh, happened was just a madness. Uh, that plus the fact that uh, when I walked into that party room that morning, she started screaming and abusing me. So uh, uh, you know, I just wasn't going to get involved with that sort of dictatorship. Um, by the way, I was number 31 uh, that I know of that has been dumped by Pauline if, if you don't toe the line. And, um, you know, uh, Brian Burson, by the way, was number 32. So uh, it, it, there is a trend. Uh, we're not all bad people. We're all trying to do the right thing. We're all loyal. The only problem is there's no loyalty 
uh, there's no reciprocal loyalty. And after you you sat as an independent uh, for a while, and then you joined uh, Cadders, the Australian Party. Uh, a lot of uh, political commentators said uh, well, you needed to join a party to to be able to be in a position to retain uh, your Senate seat at the next election because yours expires uh, June uh, 2019. So you obviously feel that there's potential with Cadders Australian Party and uh, it's a party that's been around for a while. Bob Catter has been around in politics for, for, th for 30 years. Uh, why, why did you decide that that should be your new home? Uh, I've known Bob for 40 years and he's a good conservative Christian type person. Uh, sometimes he has a few mad views but uh, generally he's there for uh, Australia and Qu or Queensland initially but for all Australians. He fights hard for the, for the uh, industries that he uh, represents. Um, he's a good, good guy, he has a party structure and uh, there's nowhere else on the right of politics that uh, would sort of represent my views. And you definitely feel that even though it's called Catter's Australia Party, it's not uh, the dictatorship that you're referring to before with Pauline? No, no, Bob's not a dictator. <laughs> He's a good guy. But, uh, you know, and, and Bob doesn't necessarily want his name on there, by the way. You know, uh, it just, that, that's what it is. And we said, well, you can't change it. You know, it has to be uh, KAP. Or, um, he, he is, there's no ego involved with Bob, I can tell you now, uh, regarding, you know, having a name on the party. Uh, but what we're trying to do is, is uh, you know, vo uh, be the voice of the people who, who the quiet minority, you know, the, the silent majority, I should say. The silent majority haven't had a voice for a long time here. Uh, there's three parties running this country now, a left-wing party, a socialist party and a communist party. And there's no one even near the centre, let alone on the right. So there's a huge vacuum there and uh, they need to be heard and they need people to stand up and talk for them and uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, um, while I can and I'm not interested in what some of the left wing people are saying about me, they can say whatever they like, doesn't worry me. Now you're considered just another cross fence senator until you gave your maiden speech where uh, you lamented the demise of the uh, white Australia policy and of course what got everyone's attention was the uh, using the phrase final solution when uh, calling for a plebiscite on uh, further immigration uh, to Australia which you didn't apologise or, or back down for. Now many people claim that the speech was made to be deliberately controversial so you can gain notoriety. What, uh, and there were even people who said that you didn't write it at all. What, uh, what did you set out to aim for with the maiden speech? Now, a couple of things there. First, I never said white Australia policy. Uh, the people who think that I did have been reading the newspapers, not the, not the speech. Show me where in that speech I said, think about white Australia policy. I didn't. I said predominantly European, which is exactly what we have here in, in Australia now. All I'm saying is let's retain that with predominantly European immigration. Uh, as to whether I was trying to get notoriety and the final solution, <coughs> right here I have, uh, this is straight from Hansard, Federal Parliament. In Federal Parliament in the last 15 years, there's been no less than 22 references by other politicians to the final solution. Uh, in State Parliament, there have been, in the same time, 17 references to the final solution. No one broke down in tears. There were no tissues wasted. Nothing. No one, no one kissed and hugged and made up like we had in the, in the hall of tears down in the lower house the other day. Uh, no one made impassioned speeches about it, because it wasn't taken out of context. But mine was taken out of context deliberately, to divert attention from some of the problems that uh, Mr. Turnbull had at the time, like reef gate and a few other things, which blew up in his face and now he's gone, which has been great for Australia. So uh, the final solution stuff was rubbish. Uh, they, they, they chose to look at that and not some of the other things I said. One of, and the thing that the main thing is a, give the Australian people a vote on not how many people come here, but who comes here. It's very important that we understand that we need to talk about who comes here and give the Australian people a vote. I'm happy to go with the umpire's decision. If the Australian people say they're happy with what's coming into the country, fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. I think that you'll find, and according to our the response we've had from Facebook and from all the other different media, uh, there's overwhelming support for what I said. Even the ABC ran their, their poll on, you know, my hate speech, and 75% of people agreed with me and 25% didn't. 
So all those politicians who must feel pretty silly right now, who made their impassioned speeches thinking that they're talking to the majority of Australians, were actually talking to the minority. So the next day they all started um, backpedalling and saying, well, it was only two words, it was taken out of context, and you know maybe I screwed up there, you know, so um, the hand-wringing, the hugging, the kissing was all in vain. Well, you know that uh, in the future no politician is allowed to use the, the phrase final solution in any context uh, whatsoever. I don't think there'll be those uh, appearing again. But yes, after your speech there was the famous uh, handshake between Bill Shorten and Malcolm Turnbull and the hug between Ed Husick and, and Josh uh, uh, Frydenberg, Frydenberg, the political establishment. That's why you want a, a plebiscite on immigration because the major parties, they ignored it for so long, and if we can have one on an issue that's important to the left, such as same-sex marriage, then it should be one for immigration. Absolutely. Why not give the Australian people a say? Uh, they deserve a say in this. It's their, it's their country, it's our country, it's, it's their communities that are going to be affected. Um, let, them, let them have a vote. You know, it, it's not hard. We've done it for, like you said, the same-sex marriage, which uh, they thought the left thought was incredibly important, but they will not let the Australian people have a say on who comes into their country because that's not in their agenda. But what I'm going to do is uh, keep pushing this. Uh, should we get the balance of power in the lower house in the next few weeks or months, uh, then I'll, we'll be insisting on it. Uh, so you know, I think the Australian people need to have a say on that, like they need to have a say whether we're in Paris. The Paris Accord is costing us bloody billions. Uh, whether we're in the United Nations, we've got uh, despotic dictators in uh, uh, in the United Nations in New York. They're telling us what we should be doing with our people in Australia. How do, how do they have any uh, authority over the Australian people? So those things need to be brought out. The Australian people need to have a, a say in those things. That's the things that's concerning a lot of Australians. The way I see it. Now, probably what surprised people the the most with the reactions to your maiden speech was uh, your former party leader uh, Pauline Hanson who said she was appalled and said it was straight from uh, Goebbels' handbook and now a lot of uh, your, your pretty social media uh, savvy as uh, Facebook that we found out uh, today hasn't been liking uh, too much but there was a lot of people reacting on social media, nationalists saying that Pauline Hanson had uh, betrayed her base and they now saw you as the authentic nationalist voice. And uh, we were talking about it before with the major parties' reaction. The nationalist vote in Australia has been ignored for, for, for so many years, and that's why there was such uh, a groundswell of support for you uh, after your speech. Uh, you're right. The, uh, you know, the, the conservative people in this country have been held down uh, with political correctness. You know, the, the, the left wingers will uh, shout you down and people going to, to rallies to, to talk about the problems they feel they're being harassed and attacked and spat at by, uh, by Antifa and all these sort of people and that's just a, a, a straight attack on the freedom of speech. Uh, we've been attacked today, we've, we've had our Facebook page shut down uh, for, for some of my views which have, I didn't think were very radical but apparently they don't fit in with the, uh, with the left wing agenda. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's sad that um, conservative people in this country are not allowed to have a say, and they get in. They will get intimidated. If you're going to a, a normal people going to a, a a speech by you know whoever it is, Lauren Southern or somebody, and then being attacked as they get off buses, the idea is to put you back into your into your homes and think, well, you know, I don't want to do that. But it's time Australians stood up, you know, and 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 shout back it and and talk back and be heard. You know, I mean, a lot of good young men fought and died in the trenches for our right to say what we we should be able to say, uh, freedom of speech. Uh, they're, they're buried in bloody mud in Flanders fields and the Somme all over, and, and in, in uh, Gallipoli and the bloody uh, jungles in uh, Borneo and everywhere else like that. Those those guys died for a reason, that was for our freedom. And the uh, freedom are uh, being taken away from us by these uh, communist grubs and, you know, you know, our young guys in those days, they had bullets flying at them, so a few placards shouldn't, you should stand up against them. And I really do think there is a groundswell of people now who are, who are coming out of the woodwork. After we saw Brexit, after we saw Trump, you know, there is a groundswell and, and we've got to keep gathering momentum. People have got to stand up and be heard at your, at your workplace, at your parties, wherever, 
say what you think, don't worry about political correctness. Now, you also made a, another uh, controversial uh, speech in the Senate uh, last week when you attacked the, the Safe Schools program where you used some uh, colourful language. Uh, you said it was designed by Como uh, perverts who'd be strung up in, in your day and called it uh, sexually deviant uh, propaganda. Uh, now, obviously, uh, you're opposed to, to Safe Schools, but why did you decide to, to use uh, this type of language? I didn't think it was that outrageous, you know, I mean, if somebody uh, 40 years ago said that they were going to teach kids all about sexuality when they're five and six and seven year old and teach them how to, uh, you know, have homosexual activity, uh, that's that's perverted, you know, and, and, and uh, like I said, if a commo pervert had, had said that to kids in those, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, they would be strung up. And, and all this safe schools is nothing to do with safe schools. It's it's straight perversion, and um, it's actually making the schools dangerous, and it's, it's uh, and it's going to destroy lots and lots of lives. It's um, you know, it's it's state-sponsored child abuse, is what it is. I've seen the books, uh, you know, I've seen the the gender fairy stuff, but it, worse uh, at the NCC the other day, I saw the the ones that go into the the primary schools and stuff, and it's straight porn, uh, teaching little kids stuff that they're sexualising kids way before their time and it, it's part of this um, taking away the rights of the parents you know destroying the fabric society but taking away the rights of the parents to be able to educate their children and bring them up the way they want to they believe these communists believe that the state will do that job better and every communist country does the same thing russia did the same thing they used to reward children for dobbing the parents in for reading you know material that they shouldn't have been reading they might, you know, start and have them against the wall and shoot the buggers, and uh, and the kids have, have have got their mum and dad into trouble, you know, because the state takes control. I don't believe the state does bring up children better than mum and dad. Let mum and dad bring up their children. And this is just a way of destroying the the bond between mum and dad and the, the parents and the children. Yeah, it's certainly a case. The more you learn about the the safe schools program and others like it, you you become more disturbed by it and you think, surely that can't be right, but it's all there in the materials. It is, it is. It, uh, <clears throat> and, it, and when parents see that material, which most of them will never do, but they need to, they will be just as shocked as you and I are. <clears throat> no, no decent parent would allow their, their kids to be um, indoctrinated or, or uh, have them exposed to that sort of material. Uh, but, you know, we were told by our state government that uh, this wasn't going to happen in Queensland, but apparently it's already happening in Queensland. So, uh, you know, we're getting a list of those schools now where it's at, and I'd strongly advise parents not to let them go to those sort of schools, or at least, uh, you know, come out and complain to your uh, members, you know, whether that does any good or not, I don't know. Now, with, uh, with your uh, straight talking in the Senate, we've seen uh, Pauline uh, respond uh, with her it's okay to be white uh, motion and uh, calling out uh, anti-white uh, racism. And then another uh, colourful spat that's gone on in the Senate is between David Linehelm and uh, Sarah Hansen young which over a motion of yours for, for women to carry self-defence. Now, there's uh, a lot of people, that, because at the, the Senate, next Senate election, you need 14.3, a full quota to win a Senate seat. So it seems that all of you are adopting a, a policy of outrage, well, outrage the, the left is, which is perfectly uh, fine. But uh, do you think that that's uh, saying these colorful things, do you think that's good for uh, Australian politics? How do you reflect on it? Uh, well, I can't speak for Pauline because uh, she flips and flops on a daily basis. I, you never know which position she's taking on a, uh, you know, on a daily basis. You know, she sort of said about the white thing and a week or two before she's saying, you know, you don't have to be white to come to Australia. Uh, I've never said anything about white coming to Australia. I've just said predominantly European. As to um, David Linehelm and uh, Sarah Hansen young uh, I'd, I'd put a motion that because we've had 24,957 sexual assaults last year, which was 9% higher than the year before, <coughs> I said it's only fair that uh, women should be able to protect themselves, you know, with a can of mace or a can of pepper spray or, or a handheld taser, none of which are offensive weapons, they're defensive, defensive uh, items, they're not 
they're not offensive items. It's not a 45 handgun, it's, it's a lousy counter spray that may save the girl's life or may save her from being raped. And then Hanson Young got up and, you know, she screamed out, you know, all men are rapists. So, and, you know, Lionhelm said, well, you know, uh, don't shag them anymore. So uh, that's, that's how that went down. But, you know, my motion was to say, what, what man wouldn't want his mum or his sister or his wife or his daughter to have the right to protect herself, finishing work at, at a hospital at two in the morning going to a car park, surely she should have the right to be able to get to a car and drive home without being attacked. And we don't have that, they don't have that right. And, and I'm saying that they should have that right. And then we have people like Senator Chisholm saying, well, more weapons in Australia won't make Australia safer. Well, I said, it's not a weapon. Uh, you know, what mug is going to pick up a can of mace and think he's going to hold up the 7-Eleven? He's not. He's going to take a knife or a baseball bat or a gun. So that's, that's a dumb thing to say. Just like Hanson Young said something stupid. Um, I, I'm just saying that give women the right to protect themselves. And, and people like uh, the young girl who was raped and murdered in the park the other, you know, a couple of months ago might still be here with us. And, and out of the 24,957 people who were sexually assaulted, we may have had 30% who, who saved themselves from that horrendous bloody experience. Yeah, it's amazing that such a common sense motion uh, such as yours led to oh, Sarah Hanson Young launching uh, legal action. Yeah, I think that'll blow up in the face, you know, because uh, uh, anyway, I mean, that's, that's between her and David, but um, you know, she attacked him uh, because he agreed with it. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess that's, that's up to the courts to decide. Well, you've certainly added a lot of flavour to the, the Senate lately, and it's been great to have this one-on-one uh, -on -one chat with you and learn a bit more uh, about you. You'll obviously have a tough fight to retain your, your Senate seat at the, the next election, but uh, all the best, and thanks for uh, speaking with the Unshackled. Oh, thanks very much for coming and talking with it, Tim. Yeah, got a good program. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everybody, that's the show for today here in Brisbane. As always, I like to remind you of upcoming events. On the 13th of October, there is the annual March for the Babies, which is in Treasury Gardens at 1pm. It is held every year during this time as it's the anniversary of the 2008 passing of Victoria's Abortion Law Reform Bill, which legalised abortion in the state until birth. So it's also held to remember the babies killed uh, during the year and to advocate for the law to be changed. Next up on the touring schedule in Australia is the internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness, who also appeared on a previous episode of this show. Uh, he is being hosted by Penthouse Australia, and you can grab your tickets by going to gavinlive.com.au. Also, as always, uh, please uh, consider supporting the work on The Unshackled. We can't do this without your support. Please either become a patron by going to patreon.com slash the unshackle or send us a direct contribution via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash the unshackle. So thanks once again for your company today and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.